Welcome to Inspired Changemakers, a podcast about all the amazing things people are doing to make the world a better place. This podcast is about creating change and the moments that inspired our guests to activate. My name is Julia Healy, and I'm the CEO of United Charitable. Stay tuned to be inspired. Alexis, thank you so much for joining me today. Um, This podcast is really about making change and things that really has activated you to want to make a difference in your community. So I'm so excited to have you here. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Well, can you start by telling me a little bit about yourself? I like to say that I'm a golf innovator. So I played professional golf for a while. I love utilizing the game of sport and the language of it, specifically golf, in order to kind of build bridges. A lot of that within golf might be from different communities, um, bringing in outside golf the organizations and things to the game and vice versa um, and figuring out unique ways to do that. Another thing is media personality. So as I'm in this tra- transitioning season, I'm doing some commentating and um, a lot of fun media things as the world of social is changing. How can we make an impact in that area? It's either you get left behind or you add value to it, right? Right. And then last, as like I said, I'm transitioning as a professional athlete. So I played professional golf for about six years. I think um, the thing that I was the best at was a long drive. So essentially taking my strength from the golf course, which was driving the ball a far, a far, a far away, far, <laughs> um, and moving that into an isolated sport where you just hit as far as you can. And what is your longest drive? How far have you actually hit it? Um, in the grid, 375. Oh, my God. But I'm heading to Denver next week. Next they have an event. Week. I'm commentating it. But I think I'm going to try and get on the grid and break the 400 record. Oh my God, Alexis, that's in, that's absolutely insane. So I have to tell you, I have a very love hate relationship with golf. So my dad, as do we all. <laughs> so my dad is a big golfer and um, my whole life, like he started caddying when he was 15. And so golf has been his whole life. Right. And so I've always been dragged with him on the golf course when my mom was like, if you think you're going to be out for five hours, you're taking that one with you. Right. Yeah. Um, so quality and, time, quali- quality time. Quality time. Um, But what always amazed me about the sport of golf is how in your head you can stay, right? So how do you make that transition between having a bad shot and then having to make another shot? Yeah, it's super hard. As And like I said, I, I don't practice as much as I used to. Yeah. And I realize that's the key is golf is so much like life. And if... Discipline equals stability, if it equals which equals confidence. Yeah. Then it all starts outside that. of the of the game, outside of the actual putting the pieces together. If you're going to put the pieces together, you have to make sure those pieces are well built. Yeah. And so for me, um, when I was playing, I realized I had an issue coming from my background as basketball. Oh, okay. um, I had a scholarship to play um, at D1, and then discovered golf late, at the end of my junior year of high school. And so, and were you just um, naturally good at it? Yeah, I had I the, the movement. I kind of understood hand-eye yeah. coordination, but on the basketball court, you know, you can be loud. Yeah, you can have emotion. Yeah, um, you can react. Yeah, as soon as something happens, and it actually propels you forward. But in golf, your reaction has to be a little bit more calculated in order yeah. to, for you, so you can make the most of the next thing that you go to, and so. They say, you know, you're supposed to spend the majority of your time in short game when you practice, a little bit of time on the range, and then you take it onto the course where you practice, and then you go in the game. And I think the mental aspect is the same way, is where you work on those little things, and then you build that up. And so now when you're in the game and something comes at you, like you hit a, a great shot, but it hits a tree, Yeah, you know, or you hit a bad shot, and it winds up in a good place, but you're still stuck on how bad your swing was. And so you're not able to take that blessing or that good point and move forward from it. So you can make the next advance to the next thing. And so I think that's, that's the, the training of being able to move forward. And, you know, I've watched my dad and, you know, drag me all over the place. And so Sam Snead, I don't know if you know that name, was his favorite golfer. And so that was really funny as I've heard so many stories about his golf game, which I think is hysterical. Who's your favorite golfer? So because I got into golf very late, I didn't have a favorite golfer. Oh, you didn't? (laughs) No, I didn't for the longest. And I found a, a random 
well, she wasn't random, but to me, yeah. a random uh, woman that w- was out of Texas. She played, I want to say softball or she played other sports. Yeah. And then she went on big break. Yeah. Got far on big break and then went on tour. So oh. she had this crazy journey, but essentially got into the sport really late. And her name's Jarena Pillar. Okay. She wind up playing on, you know, the okay. Solheim Cup, all the Olympics, all the yeah. big things. And um, I actually got to do life with a little bit with her a little bit in oh, college, wow. which was really cool. But I think some of my favorite golfers are um, people that aren't professionals. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I think the other thing too, that my, that really has been instilled with me as I watch people that play golf or I'm, I'm in the environment is really how meticulous it all is, right? How you have to, what, what is the etiquette on a golf course, right? Like I remember when I was younger, I took <laughs> the pin out of the too early and I got yelled, you know, I got schooled on what yeah. was the appropriate etiquette. How do you think that really translates to real life and how can it knowing golf and learning how to play golf translate? I think if you watch somebody play golf, whether it's their first time or they've been playing, you can learn about who they are as a person. If it's their first time ever playing and they're already like, oh, I'm not good at this. I don't want to do this. If they already have that mindset going into it, yeah. you're kind of like, oh, okay. Yeah. You, don't, you don't like challenges. There's some fear there. Um, you're already setting yourself up for excuses. Um, if there's someone that's played golf for a while, um, yeah, character comes out when you're kind of pushed to the wall yeah. and golf will push you <laughs> everywhere. And what would you say to the people that say it's a man's sport? Um. They definitely have it wrong. It's a, it's a sport for all. And I think kind of like you were saying that golf has these rules. There's golf rules. And then there's um, the, the, the rules that the world has made of golf. And I think that's what sets that up of, oh, it's a man's sport. Oh, you can't do this. You can't do that. And like Tiger Woods, who kind of pushed the limit on that, or Renee Powell, who is one of my favorite golfers, who pushed the limit on that. And even before her, you look at Althea Gibson, who was a tennis player and then had no money to play golf, right. transitioned over and did that. I think it's little things like that that relate to life. And you need to know your boundaries, right. but there really aren't any rules. So going into that, golf is a very expensive sport. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about your foundation. Yeah, super excited. Um, One, it's been so cool working with Athletes Charitable because I always, on tour, my thing was to practice and then try and get some girls to go and volunteer somewhere in every city that we went. And so I've always had that heart of service. And um, I think I always thought that golf was the platform in order to do good. Um, when I realized golf is good and that you can do good through golf. And so uh, Belt and Drive exists to do what I feel like my heartbeat of why I exist, which is building bridges, um, creating community through the game of golf and growing existing communities and creating opportunity through education, which was exposure, I think is one of the biggest things. And that's something that golf has given me. And then also mental health, which is a really big thing for me and something that I've learned a lot about going through that, um, but providing um, mental health care for uh, current athletes. I'd like to thank United Charitable for sponsoring today's Inspire Changemakers podcast. United Charitable is a national nonprofit that focuses on guiding you on your charitable journey. Whether you like to simply streamline your giving or you like to create your own charitable initiative, United Charitable has the knowledge and resources to support you. If you'd like to learn more, check out the link in our bio. And so tell me, who is the first person that put a golf club in your hand? Probably my dad. So quick story is my dad played kind of like your dad. Yeah. He had to drag me, Yeah, uh, but he never did. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, he had to choose between golf and his family. Yeah. And he chose his family. So he never played when I had memory of yeah. the game. Yeah. And so later on, the person that got me into golf was uh, my health teacher. Really? <laughs> Um, and then that's so funny. So then tell me too, then what is your earliest memory of philanthropy? I would say my earliest memory is Christmas before my family, like the first, the first thought I have of Christmas is before we could ever open presents. My family would take a ton of food 
and gifts and we would just drive around and wherever we felt led we would just drop off stuff there um and there was some really cool friendships that came out of that but um yeah and as a kid you kind of get really sad to open gifts after that yeah (laughs) but that's my first yeah first memory of philanthropy oh that's awesome and so it's tell me when you said you felt like you had a calling yeah tell me a little bit about your calling I think um I realized like my calling is essentially just doing good, serving others and living in community and figuring out how to solve problems. And um, oftentimes I might not know what that looks like as far as career path or whatever, but I feel like if I'm following that, I'm on the right, right. I think we always dream and the dream is the end goal, but the calling is the route to get there. Right. And what impact would you really like to create? So when it's all said and done and people remember you, what impact do you want to create? Yeah, I think the biggest impact is um, opportunity. You know, there's not a lot of women in golf. There's not a lot of minorities in golf. Um, Largest growing areas, but also um, lowest retention. Um, And I think my biggest goal is that someone would say, she utilized the language of sport in order to change communities around the world. And so tell me a little bit about the programming you're doing. What are the upcoming plans? Yeah, a lot of fun things. I think my most passionate piece is park golf, Okay, which is taking, uh, the thought is golf exists outside of the, should exist outside of the country club walls. Yeah, And so for that piece, it's, well, what's the lowest entry that we can get golf to people? Right. And that's a park. And parks build a lot of things as I spoke of earlier it's helps with um helps communities financially helps um with safety right um and so building structures um that represent that community um and first that looks like just hosting golf clinics and exhibitions and hangouts at park so cool. local parks um as well as paint by par okay so getting kids out and a question that i always had is why do Public golf courses, their clubhouses look exactly like private golf courses, which is one of the most uninviting spaces. Right. And so let's go fill those walls up with murals ah. and have kids come along and fill in and paint paint by par. Um, and the third, as we talked about exposure, is um, allowing kids and women and people to know that they can also exist inside the country club walls. And so setting up, I'm working with some schools around here in Atlanta, as well as Louisiana of field trips to the country club, field trips to where they build clubs for STEM and science, because a lot of kids want to be professional athletes, but they don't know what else exists within this, the sport realm. Um, So growing up, I actually worked at a country club And in the summers, I would do summer camp. Um, So I was the best camp counselor ever. (laughs) Um, But it was so much access that the, you know, the kids that I was counseling had. I mean, they knew how to play tennis. I mean, I have 10-year-olds that knew how to play tennis, that knew how to play golf, that really understood how it all worked. Um, And so I really thought that was interesting of how you, at that age, they already understood like those social norms and what advantages now they're going to have the rest of their life because they had that opportunity. Yeah. So I think it's amazing that you're really bringing that environment and that community that you talked about. And I feel like almost that's kind of what Athletes Charitable has done for me is I had not a lot of knowledge of a lot of different things and now having that backing and understanding, it's really easy to kind of be able to grow now. Right. Um, Well, our goal at United Charitable and at Athletes Charitable is really to help people live like find the light that's inside them and be able to live in that space rather than you know we do the accounting the compliance all of the fun (laughs) the stuff that I think is fun right um but and it's really great to have people live their passion and really just be able to when they wake up in the morning know that they're making a difference now is this a family thing for you like is your whole family involved in philanthropy or is it just is it just kind of been in your ingrained I think that's just my family's lifestyle so I definitely think i picked it up by just watching my parents. And are they involved now in the foundation today? Uh, They help out here and there. Yeah. My brother is a a big advocate. He's in sport. And so. Are you a better golfer than your brother? Hands down. I'm (laughs) I'm the better athlete. Really? I'm probably the worst athlete in my family. (laughs) (laughs) And how about now? Like when you, you and your dad go and play, do you, are you better than him? 
Yes, yes. Oh, God, I love every, <laughs> I really, I love every moment of that. Um, but my other question really then becomes, you know, for people that are not sure how to listen to the calling that's inside them, what advice would you give them to really start to try to find their passion? Yeah, I think clarity equals confidence. And so to just sit and take time to figure out who you are as a person really helps to find what your passion and calling is. Um, confusion will always lead to chaos, will lead to um, just really things that are outside of where you should be going. And yeah. so I think having grace for yourself and knowing that any little thing that you do, you're learning more about yourself and learning more about the direction that you should be going into. And you touched on it earlier when we started talking about really like the mental wellness um, and how really goth has helped you, but how has finding your passion and living in your philanthropy helped your mental awareness? Oh, so much because you're playing for something and you're living for something greater than yourself. Yeah. And how does that make you feel? Um, whole. Whole. That's yeah. a, out of all the times I've asked that question, that is probably one of my favorite responses, whole. Um, and you know, you talk about your, your journey and where you've come to this point. How hard was it for you to step away from being a professional golfer? Um, I stepped away because of mental health. Really? Yeah. Um, and that was six months ago. Yeah. Um, and so that was an easy decision. I think now it's, it is tough because you miss the, I think I miss the routine. Um, but I'm really excited about uh, what's next. I think the desert places are always some of the best places. Oh, that's a great. And so one of the things that we have seen with like, you know, athletes that have transferred from one is for me, and it's so funny because I'm not a professional, right? Any of these things. I, there is no way in my, in my brain that I can understand that you would ever have a problem like saying, hey, donor A, support my cause by writing me a check, right? And it's so funny to me because I think of the pressure of people watching you play golf. Like I watch myself play golf and I back out. Like I'm like, <laughs> I'm like people turn around, face the other way, yeah. you know? Um, so tell me why other people should be supporting your cause and, and, and what you're trying to do. Yeah, I think overall it's, making, um, to be a part of creating opportunity. And I think a lot of times, like going back to your calling is yeah. that we all have different callings, but we can support each other in whatever route that we're going. And so for me, I have to keep a conscious mind because I want to help everyone Yeah, is that that's not the lane that I'm supposed to be in, but right. I can give money or I can give time because time's huge too, um, to be able to help them to pursue greater good within the world. And so I think the same goes to whenever asking people to join me in that and also, um, reminding them that female athletes don't make a lot of money. And so every little bit helps. <laughs> um, we have donors all the time that are like, oh, but I only can give her $50 a month or I can only donate huh. $50 a month. But I'm like $600 a year, year after year. If you, she had 20 of those people, what could that turn into? $50 a month helps for a free session of therapy for someone. $50 a month is, you know, a, a can of paint. Yeah. It's, you know, it's it's gas for a kid to be able to get somewhere or do something. So every little thing helps. And we kind of, you know, you're talking about your calling. It took me a very long time to really understand that it was okay that doing finance and accounting and back office systems really still did help. And that, that was a way to be productive because I'm not, you know, on the front front lines at all of really helping the kids or looking at them in the eyes. But when I get to see it through what you do and all the photos, the pictures and events, and it's just absolutely amazing. What impact have you made that you really is the most meaningful to you? Oh, the most meaningful impact is probably just I think when someone comes up to me and just says, you know, uh, thank you, or, or being able to see, I think oftentimes we're able to plant seeds but not see them grow. Mm -hmm. To be able to see a seed grown is probably the biggest, greatest impact that, I'll, that I get to see because you don't get to see that often. Right. Um, and then if you really had to kind of talk about how do you think change happens? 
Oh, that's a great question. I think change happens when you get a group of people that come together and that work together in order to um, solve a problem. That's awesome. And then if you had to say that there was one person that inspired you the most, who would that be? Um, definitely my mom. Your mom? Why yeah. is that? That's a very, but why? I saw my mom, first of all, mothers in general, like selfless. I have a six and nine year old. Yeah. 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 You, you, there, you not necessarily give up on dreams, but alter the path of getting yeah. to the dream. And I got to see firsthand my mom be one of the most intelligent lawyers that, that people still come up to me to this day and go, I mean, your mom could have been president, you know, like little things like that. So cool. Um, but she made a lot of sacrifices for us. So someone one day can be like, your daughter's president. Yeah. I don't want to be president, but you know, of whatever that might be. It's, yeah. Yeah. Um, my youngest does Taekwondo and she's into breaking boards, which <laughs> I've never done a day in my life. So now that I'm like, what is front plot? Like I, it's just really funny to watch, to support her yeah. in that journey. When you, t- you know, not everybody has a family environment that supports them in their dreams. So how does your, you know, foundation really come in and help those, those in need? I think creating that family, I think that's why community is so big. I think, you know, what you asked, what is, um, I forgot what the question was, but being able to see what change looks like yeah, is seeing communities fill the needs of people, like knowing, like knowing my neighbors, knowing yeah. if kind of almost living back in agricultural time period where yeah. you really had to rely on everyone else yeah. for everything right um and so I think that is what Belt and Drive kind of exists to do is to fill those gaps to create that community yeah that's awesome and then you know when you're talking about building the community what kind of people are you looking for are you looking for volunteers donors what kind of community are you trying to build I think donors um for sure um volunteers one of the biggest things is belt and drive doesn't exist to recreate anything there's right. so many different organizations out there and we want to just piece it together so yeah. just as b- building communities you know within cities but also building communities within nonprofit spaces to see how can we you know generosity mentality over scarcity and so i think just knowledge um donors and I'm always down for more mentors. I'm always down to watch and learn. And why do you think women make such good philanthropists? Um, I think innately because we're nurturers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think going back to the mom, you know, my mom and many people's mother being that first thought is, I think we all contribute as men and women to, to different things, but how we contribute looks different. And I think the way that women come in is just, we're able to view things in a different way. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much for being on our podcast Thanks today. For having we me. really appreciate it. Um, and I am so excited to attend some of your next events. So yes, excited to tee it up soon. Awesome. All right. Thanks so much. Find Inspired Changemakers on Instagram, YouTube, and LinkedIn and comment on all the awesome things you are doing to make this world a better place. Don't forget to subscribe.